first of all, I think we need to be really careful of just taking UK evidence as, as what we should be working from. I mean, there's lots of international good practice, not just the ICN guidelines, but much more broadly around this stuff. There's lots of international evidence about you know, what are the impacts for a given species or the best way to manage them. And at the moment, I think there's a, there's a risk um, that we've seen playing out you know, in the projects that we've looked at that the statutory authorities and, and perhaps the, the species task force that's been established actually just looks at the context in the UK, which we've got to remember is, is about the most degraded biologically degraded country in the world. We're at 179 or something at the moment. I think we've moved up from 186, probably due to some kind of statistical uh, uh, device in the last couple of years. But, you know, we are really low down on the spectrum. And so we need to be referencing where these animals already are interacting with people and farmers and what's the... the, the in many cases, very successful management strategies that can overcome these things. So, as you know, uh, referenced by, by Tom there, one, of, one example would be uh, from work I did for the OCS Development Institute at one stage, you know, compensation does not work. You don't put compensation schemes in. You, you, you make payments for presence. So if you want a species present, so if you decided that politically... And, uh, you know, to achieve, as I say, the targets but like 30% of land and sea in better condition by 2030, which needs to be done rapidly and with ambition, that you need some of these species, these keystone species in play. Then you start to look at the management practices that have worked elsewhere and you use the evidence on whether there really are impacts on these things. So I'm not disagreeing with Tom on that at all. Something like white-tailed eagles in Scotland are predominantly scavengers if you want them in play as scavengers, then you work out a system for management and you work out a system for paying for their presence rather than compensating for apparent losses. There are too many ways that doesn't work. That's, that's kind of well described in the literature. So, you know, we need to work from the right standpoints and, and they're not actually to be found here necessarily. They're to be found in the broader context. So the Species Task Force needs to be referencing that. Thank you. Um, and Judah Kales, the Species Reintroduction Task Force, as was already Task Force, as was already mentioned, was launched in May 2021 for England and held its first meeting earlier this month. Have you been involved in the task force so far, and what would you like to see from it? Well, I think, like Evan, I discovered it um, rather by uh, chance. Um, so, uh, no, we haven't been involved. Um, what, uh, so I'm not quite sure what they're supposed <coughs> to be. From the evidence that uh, the chair provided to this committee, it comes across as, a, as an advisory group. Uh, but the word task force suggests that it is intended to be more. In terms of what we would like to see, we would quite like it to have a role of scientific advice of potentially due diligence on applications, that would probably be helpful. And could it be a, a mechanism whereby, uh, whereby conflict is managed? I think for that to happen, however, the, the, uh, the, the uh, composition of that task force would ne need to be different and would ha need to have, for example, you know, farmers and landowners on it, as well as uh, potentially other type of land managers uh, because wild species don't, um, don't stop in the countryside, as um, we know from wild boars in Barcelona and various other places. So it's not quite clear what the task force is there to do. It, it, it can probably have a, a really good impact and a really good role, but at the moment this is uh, a very nebulous and I'm not sure that it is uh, fit for the purpose which government intends. And Evan... Um what, what are your thoughts on how the tra task, how transparent DEFRA has been on the task force, <coughs> including how it influences Natural England's decision-making process? Um, to date, I would say that it hasn't been transparent enough. I would hope that it's going to be a lot more transparent because otherwise it will fail in what it's presumably aiming to, doing, to do. But I, um, again, we're presuming what it's actually set up to do. We don't really know who it's going to advise. Is it going to advise Natural England or is it going to advise DEFRA? Because uh, there are multiple different bits of DEFRA involved in all this stuff. Is it going to advise ministers? Um, there are, you know, that makes a huge difference. 
Um, so um, I think it's critical that that whatever advice it provides is is also transparent and, and uh, we can all see that provision. I think one of the, going back to Alice's points about the beaver process, you know, we, we didn't see the advice that went from Natural England to, to ministers on beavers. We've got no idea how that was translated. Um, the process around that has been exceptionally slow. The evidence is really good. Um, what I'd like to see them now focusing on in that instance is actually moving it into the next phase of, of how to manage beavers in the landscape because that's where we are. So rather than you know NGOs as we are at the moment setting up, in our case, the East Kent Advisory um, Group for Beavers, which is uh, you know taking into account landowners and and uh, uh, you know having some really good discussions where we start to turn the perceptions of beaver um, conflict into you know beaver activity and how to manage that activity rather than you know so de-escalating some of the language and, and and coming to you know really sort of positive places in terms of what we could do, um, then that that transparency and that mandate is, is, is really critical. Thank you. And finally... I, I might just add that, but okay. we have had some communication from the task force, um, uh, and they, they've obviously given us a list of their members, and they're providing bi biographies which will be posted on their task force on gov.uk. What I'm intrigued about here is that it, if they're being hosted on gov.uk, but they're writing their own terms of reference or they're editing their own terms of reference. Well, who has set the objectives for the Species Reintroduction Task Force? You know, this is, it seems quite peculiar to me, the way that this is happening. Um, the makeup of the board, were they appointed by the chair? What's the transparent, is it, is it a public appointment process? Because if it was a public appointment process, they'd normally be endorsed by the Secretary of State. And I, I think there's some really big questions mm -hmm. here because actually it, it could provide a u really useful safe space to have these discussions around species reintroduction, which I think we'd all agree is something that's absolutely required. And so fundamentally, we don't want to write it off before it's started, but I think it's got off to a very, very poor start so far. And, and so transparency, clarity of purpose uh, are essential, but it sounds from that email as though they're, they're writing their own terms of reference. Mm -hmm. Which, who is setting? The state has already ruled out two of the species that they might be considering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at least that reduces the burden for them, doesn't it? So, um, you know, they know where to focus their energies, which um, it could be quite helpful. But look, there's some real concerns there. So, and yeah. Thank you. And finally, uh, Professor uh, Alistair, do you have anything further to add? Just one thing. Uh, I support everything that's been said. Um, it does, I, I saw somewhere, and I, can't, I couldn't re-find it, but I saw somewhere a list of some of the members. Maybe it was through one of these meetings, through these discussions. It does seem to be very heavily weighted towards academics. And don't be fooled by my title, I'm not an academic. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so it's really short on policy and practice uh, by the looks of it, and that, that gap needs to be filled. So I'm here in Westminster with the director of Rewild in Britain, Alistair Driver. Hi. Um, and we've just been testifying at the EFRA, which is the Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs Committee, yep. hearing on um, reintroduction of species. Um, we were sitting on a panel with a representative from the uh, Countryside Landowners Association and another representative from the National Farmers Union. Um, so it's an interesting panel. How do you think yeah, it went? It was a good mix, wasn't it? I thought, I thought normally they would just have everyone on the same side on one panel, yeah. and then they had another panel later from the other side of the story. Having us all together actually created a really good debate, didn't it? it was I good think discussion. it did. Yeah. And it enabled us to counter some of the myths that were being promoted That's right. from other circles. Yes. So, um, yeah. so it was, a, it was a good two-way discussion. And I thought the interesting thing was that even though there were clearly some kind of party lines being trotted out, actually we did agree on quite a large number of things in the end didn't yeah, we yeah yeah there, there were i was surprised actually at the consensus mm. and it was great to hear the nfu say they're not opposed per se to species reintroductions but you need a proper strategy yeah you need a proper plan it needs to start national particularly for the contentious species yes. they yeah. accepted the idea of having tiered that's right tiered system yeah. where the non-contentious could be much more streamlined process yeah 
Um, so yeah, lot, lots, quite a lot in common. I think my, my concerns coming out of it are still that the mechanism that's being proposed in terms of this species reintroduction task force yeah. doesn't really look like it's up to the job, doesn't really look like it's got the right people, and doesn't really necessarily, isn't clear, what its terms of reference is, who it's actually going to be talking to. The ministers, DEFRA, Natural England, it's a bit of a... Yeah, yeah, it's all uncertain. a bit mysterious. It's mysterious at the moment, and uh, there's lack of detail, so we, and we don't know what its clout is, do we? We don't know what clout they're going to have with ministers or DEFRA. No. Um, but one thing, you know, one thing, I was, as you know, I was at pains to point out, is that we need a massive culture shift from this no why kind of approach to species reintroductions to a yes if approach. Yes, Absolutely. if you follow IUCN guidelines. Yes. And, and that needs to apply to this task force, it needs to apply to ministers, yeah. it needs to apply even to statutory agencies yes. who are not necessarily all on board with it. No. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's a long way to go to switch that culture around. Yeah. But, and know, that's a good uh, first step, I think. And that's what's required to enable the ambition to then um, make sure that species reintroduction, particularly of keystone species, sort of ecosystem engineers, uh, is actually linked into you know delivering the the, the biodiversity targets we signed up to internationally, nationally, yeah. linking into you know providing climate resilience, adaptation, and all those things. Yeah. Because at the moment, I just don't think government as a whole sees that this is one of the key mechanisms for actually achieving those things. Yeah, They're just seeing yeah. it as a little kind of siloed problem. That, that, that's a very important point. The benefits of reintroducing these species should be absolutely part of the assessment. And, yeah. and it, was in, it was noticeable that pretty much all the questioning was talking about the negatives. That's right. You know, what if this goes wrong? What are the risks of doing that? Yeah. You know, what about the impacts? That's meaning a, detrimental impacts, yep. not thinking that there might be 10 times as many beneficial no, impacts no. that you have to weigh up. So yeah. I think we got that, we got that point across think, well, didn't we? Where we they did. need to balance the whole thing in any environmental impact assessment yeah. or farming impact assessment or societal impact assessment. You've got to look at it all sides of the but I, but I think that's where you know the Wildlife Trust, Rewilding Britain and others actually need to start to develop a much stronger common voice. Is yeah. that, you know, we actually, it shouldn't be about if we do this, yeah. it should be about how we do it, yep. doing it properly, and then achieving the maximum possible benefits, being ambitious, and actually helping the government to deliver on its own targets, yep. um, including things like biological abundance that it's put through this year. It has no other mechanism to do this. Yep. Without species reintroductions of keystone species in place, there is no mechanism for, for success in the UK. Yep. Bring it on. Absolutely. Bring it on.